Good morning, dearest Jayshree ma'am. In fact, it is a great pleasure to interview somebody who is, uh, you know, like an icon for me. Uh, because when I was a gra post-graduation student, it was a time when um, in our library we had a copy of Ancient Promises. And uh, during an afternoon, I actually had a glimpse of this book. And I thought I'll read it some other day. And I actually took it from the library. But the first line of the book, you know, captured my attention. My marriage ended today. You know, you have certain books with um, exquisite opening lines like, you know, Moby Dick has Call Me Ishmael or the famous opening lines of 1984 and so on. This line hooked me to read that book. And ever since that day, it has been my dream to meet you, ma'am. And um, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the novel because some of you had to study that. And even otherwise, it's a, it has been a bestseller throughout. And uh, you'll be wondering why I'm talking only about Ancient Promises. She has written other great works also, especially Rani. Then uh, I'm very, um, you know, very intrigued by the titles of some of her works, like Secret and Lies. Uh, it's not exactly a trilogy, but they are connected together. Three books coming out in succession in 2009, 10, and 11, Secret and Lies. Then it's actually a very interesting book about um, female friendships. Now we talk about female bonding and all. So this was a pioneer in that regard. Then Secrets and Sins, which has got a very interesting Malayalam translation, Rehasiyangalum Nunagalu. No, very uh, intriguing for a Malayali. Then uh, also a scandalous secret. You must have noticed that three of these books has got secret in that. So we'll be also speaking about the secret behind her success as a writer also. Now, uh, my, my first uh, question, of course, you know, her latest work is A House for Mr. Bishra, uh, which is actually a book about the travails of finding out a, a space to live in a very congested place like Trivandrum. Um, so that is her latest. In fact, she has not written a novel after that, and we are eagerly waiting for that, and I'm sure that the audience will actually ask you to write a, a novel very soon. So we are expecting that. So my first question is, um, you know, um, there has been a transition from ancient promises to other genres, especially historical fiction and so on. So um, it came out in the year 2000. So when you actually look at this novel in a retrospect manner, so after 23 years, what do you think of it? First of all, thank you very much, Kaikashi, for such a brilliant introduction. I knew the moment I heard that you were that I was in the hands of a university professor, I thought, oh, I'm in a very safe spot, and I'll be absolutely fine because sometimes you get moderators or journalists who are not that familiar with your work, and I can see that you 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 sort of well well prepared, and probably over time, isn't it, over years. So I really appreciate that. And to the students here who... One second, uh, can the students please raise your hands? Those of I you who have studied there this. Are, there yeah. are people here. Oh my goodness me. They've so many all hands. read your novel. I, I can only s apologize to you for having, <laughs> having foisted you with, a, with another book to read when you have so many you know, books on your syllabus and things. But it's always so thrilling to meet uh, actual readers and people, you're not just readers. If you're students who've read the book, that means you've read it properly. You've kind of analyzed it. You've brought your own special insight to the book. And that is very, very special to me because when I read some of these PhD theses and all which come online, some of them are available, it amazes me that people have seen so much in a book which, to come to your question, I actually wrote in a bit of a daze. And I wrote it in a period of my life when I was actually very, very depressed because um, a number of things had happened. Uh, many of you, I mean, all of you who've read Ancient Promises will know that I have a daughter with special needs. So but she was, uh, she, you know, she required a lot of care in the mornings before going to school and I, she, I couldn't just sort of leave her with a childminder or something like that. So when I got this BBC job, which I think was mentioned by the lovely girl who did the introduction, um, I had to get up and go to the news desk, be there at 6 o'clock in the morning, which is the first um, slot for all news programs, which meant I have to leave the house at 4 o'clock, <laughs> leave the house at 5, get up at 4 and do everything else. So my mother came from here, she lives in Trivandrum, she came to London and uh, helped to look after my daughter, who was then about um, maybe about 
12, 13 years old, but needed physical help with her with getting ready. So mom, my mother came and uh, helped to look after her. But as you know, anyone who's traveled, your tourist visa runs out after six months. So she, six months went, came and went, and she had to return here. And at that point, I had to resign. There was no other option. I had to resign my very glittering BBC job and sit at home. And my, early in the morning, my husband would leave for work. My daughter would I'd drop her at the bus stop uh, at about 8.30 or 9. And then I'd come home and find that I, I felt I was the only person in the world who didn't have a job and who was stuck at home. And you know, I felt very sorry for myself. So that was the birth of Ancient Promises. I was feeling a bit rotten. I sat down with a new computer and started trying to just uh, produce something to keep myself amused and also to learn the functions of Word. My husband said, you do write something and I'll teach you how to cut and paste and all that. I didn't have a clue how to do all that. So um, I wrote a chapter which funnily enough, Kaikashi and I were talking just now. She said her favorite scene is the scene of the marriage in Guru Ayur when Janu actually goes and marries this stranger. He's a relative stranger to her. So um, that was, oddly enough, Kaikashi, the first page. And I was only planning to write one page. My husband said one page. I thought, right, I'll write one page. And that this was a scene because it was a very vivid memory in my mind. It was something I couldn't get out of my mind, even though I wanted to. So that descriptive thing actually stayed pretty much the same, even though many editors came to it, many you know, eyes were on that when we were crafting, making it into a book. Uh, that stayed pretty much the same, because I think the memory was so powerful, the writing was quite strong. So um, that, that was how it started, the journey. But the truth was that I couldn't stop at one page. And I, I'm not exaggerating, I've said this story many times before, but the truth is, that I simply could not stop. There was something which had opened up inside me and it, it started to pour and pour and pour. So there was a kind of cathartic element to, this, to the whole writing of this book. It was something I had submerged somewhere in my deepest subconscious to try and forget. I thought it's a part of my past. I don't really want to go there anymore. I've been lucky to get a different start in life. I left India, I'd gone to England, so it was, I was a different person, I was becoming a different person, or trying to be a different person. But this submerged self emerged in the shape of Janu. And some of it, her, some of her is me, and some of her is sort of um, the me I wanted to be, or something like that. It, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm as nice a person as Janu is, she's very sweet. <laughs> so that's it. So that was, yeah, so if when looking back, as you say, having tried different sorts of writing, I actually have no category into which I can put ancient promises. So I could say Rani is historical fiction. I could say love story uh, for his, my sister is a binary narrative type of book. And every time I've written, I could say accidents like love and marriage is a comedy of manners. Because every time I've written one of those, I've had a plan in mind. Oh, I know what I'll do. I want to be something, do something different. So why don't I try my hand at historical fiction? Because I was reading Philippa Gregory and I thought, oh, I'd like to try my hand at this. So all the other books grew in a more um, planned fashion, in a more structured way. I kind of had understood the, the genre and the structure before even starting. But Ancient Promises just poured, like I said. It literally came rushing out of me. It took just three months to write. So now when people tell me 23 years, as you said, 23 years later, that it still means something to people, I am utterly astonished. I just cannot see uh, how something that was written in such a, I, I wouldn't say in a hurry, because I wasn't de deliberately hurrying, but it was just the force or the velocity with which it came out was something I've never been able to replicate with any other book. The only replication that happens is towards the end of a book. Uh, by then, the momentum has built up so much that I want to get it finished, and I start speeding up and speeding up. But this Ancient Promises, I think, from the word go, it was like that. I, I think the first day I wrote about 40 pages, and so by the end of that, I mean, much of it would have been rubbish and we would have edited and all that. But I think I, yeah, I knew at the end of that day that I had something to offer some, some sort of a bigger story to tell than I had realized. <laughs> it's a very long answer for a vain. <laughs> They're waiting question. to hear you, so you know, you can be as long as possible. 
um, you know one thing uh, about ancient promises is that you know if you if you look at the storyline if if i were to sum it up you will have a teenage love then in a forced arranged marriage not forced actually it is partially uh, you know uh, she was convinced into that marriage and uh, then you have the trauma happening and then walking out of the marriage it will sound like a very cliched kind of a storyline but what is so it's a very slow burn kind of a novel as far as i mean what I, as a reader i have felt it it begins in a very tragic way and suddenly it catches up and it catches up in such a way that you know it is very interesting now uh, why i said that you know it's very interesting is because every woman in kerala or for that matter every indian bride goes through that stage you know the the marriage even if you had uh, you know a set of woke parents as they call it you know we have a, a parent who actually tells you that you know your marriage will be a very unconventional one we'll be having a wedding uh, under a tree and so on but when it comes to the actual marriage they actually want us to have a very traditional marriage with all the gold sovereigns and all kinds of things even if you have a partner who is you know very understanding and you have been um, fallen into love into that marriage it is actually a you know no deal for everyone and this chapter is particularly very interesting because she gets married at guruvayur i really don't know how many of you have gone to a marriage at guruvayur <laughs> it itself is a nodial you know uh, you just you don't know what is happening who is the bride who is the groom lot of confusion and uh, that is so beautifully illustrated in that chapter chapter 5 okay. uh, and just, just uh, a university professor to know chapter 5 second paragraph <laughs> i have no memory of where it is in the book or anything <laughs> so um, it will be our pleasure if you read a, a few reading. paragraphs from that I should have remembered to bring my glamorous kannadi. Huh? <laughs> it's black, it's horrible. I keep travel with this because it's plastic and unbreakable. So I have a very glamorous pair with a copper rim and all that. But I'm sorry, it's at home. <laughs> Don't take any photos now. <laughs> Is it where to stop? No? I don't want to go on and on. Oh, oh that one. okay um yeah i i haven't read this for so long and i don't really know how much i should do th- this is her in guruvayur i think they now they haven't exactly it's not the wedding scene is it okay it is yeah so let's do it from here the chosen muhurtam was 11 o'clock the most auspicious hour of the day and most practical to serve lunch afterwards It was also least likely to rain <laughs> and upset the careful arrangements at that time of day. To say least likely to rain in Kerala. <laughs> Yesterday it started raining and I think these organizers must have been panicking. But they were wrong. At about 9 the heavens opened up and it started to rain as though some broken-hearted goddess just could not stem her tears anymore. Worried looking men for gathered around discussing quick changes of plans so that the guests did not get soaking wet. Women issued dark threats to children who might run out into the rain spoiling their brand new silk clothes. I sat in my room now so dark it needed all the lights turned on. Outside thunder rumbled forbiddingly but inside a life was being refashioned while a bride took shape and children ran up and down the corridors screaming their heedless joys. Preeti Chechi who had been assigned to do my hair and makeup actually in real life her name was Nimmi Chechi huh? she's very gorgeous cousin of mine who does makeup brilliantly i wish she was here today <laughs> so preeti chechi had been assigned to do my hair and makeup she ran a successful beauty parlor in bangalore waxing bleaching eyebrows upper lip and full bridal makeup and took to her task with masterful aplomb a monument to confidence in an ocean of confusion Preeti Mole look at that rain i should do it in malayalam no what do we do it will all be a mess now amma said scurrying in with my small sandalwood jewelry box oh don't worry perama it will be okay my makeup is all waterproof imported from us rain swimming tears no problem i hope she was right her confidence was comforting rain swimming and best of all tears no problem 
The rain continued to drum its relentless mocking rooftop rock while my powders and creams were put on. First base foundation, then a dusting of powder, then liquid eyeliner and mascara, lip liner, lipstick, blusher, bronzer. Sorry to the boys here <laughs> who are wondering what is all this that girls put on their faces. The blouse, now down to two pointies <laughs> instead of four, thanks to the near decapitation of Venu Taylor. Underskirt, sari, jewelry, a bride was definitely taking shape. I looked in the mirror. She was glowing in deep magenta silk that was shot with tiny gold threads. She looked luminous and beautiful. The picture of a school, not quite college-going figure clad in jeans was receding, even in my head. I screwed up my eyes, blurring my reflection as much as I could to see if I could remember what that girl looked like, but she'd gone. Preeti Chichi smacked my shoulder gently. What are you doing, Janu? Janu, enda cheyinna? Ah, I make up okay, poo will <laughs> She will ruin your makeup. <laughs> I think I'll stop there because the rain carried on and on and the wedding was a bit of a mess. <laughs> See, I told you, no, they, they love this book. <laughs> In fact, one nice thing about this book is that, you know, you have, uh, they have not tra brutally translated some of those delicacies like neyapam, boli, uh, even ammumma, even the non-Malayali would have studied ammumma and appupa by the end of the book, right? My editor in England is an English woman called Louise Moore. She was reading the description of, I don't know if it was boli, perhaps it was boli or neyapam. And she said later, what is this book? Polly. <laughs> I would love to taste Polly. And I thought, how am I going to get hold of Polly? She probably thinks I can make it at home or something. The, so. the, the book has so much of Kerala in that, you know, that um, I can't help noticing the similarities between um, God of Small Things and this one, where also you find the entire, uh, you know, the landscape of Ayamanam comes before you alive. So I was copying her like crazy. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> she had been very successful about uh, yeah. two years maybe before this before came this, out. Yeah, that's so yeah, I was, I had fallen in love with God of Small Things oh. and I think, again, subconsciously a little bit of all that crept in. <laughs> I felt emboldened mm -hmm. to use Malayalam words and things, otherwise yeah. I might have been trying to find, find uh, yeah, something it's around it. It's actually no um, substitute for words like neyapam, boli and so on. You can't say it's a yellowish Yellow. circle, a exactly. delicacy, you know, it takes up the flavor from yeah, that, so exactly. that's it. Um, now, uh, moving on to uh, your next book, which is a very, very successful work. It is actually a very ambitious work also, Rani, which has been a well-researched, well-documented, so much of thought has gone into it. But when the novel came out, it was immediately banned by the UP government. Yeah. Uh, and uh, later on, we found that, you know, when Manikarnika, the film was being shot, people were immediately um, rushing to find out if this is actually loosely based on Rani. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have fringe groups always attacking movies on the basis of their, the cast, you know, or um, a woman protagonists who are revered a lot, like Padmavat, you know, and so on. So, um, what, do you, what is your take on um, historical characters, especially women, who step out of the boundaries, especially in fictional? Uh, cases, you know, why is that people are so annoyed, they can't stand that? It may be something to do with that desire to put women on a pedestal still, where, you know, seeing them all full-blooded <laughs> in all the different facets of womanhood sort of upsets the conservative patriarchy, perhaps. So this was, that was the essential problem, I think, with Rani, was that um, where, you know, her image had been plucked out of the pages of history. There were other women who were perhaps more deserving of becoming this national icon, the symbol of the first war of independence and all that. Begum Hazrat Mehel is the one who immediately springs to mind because um, she was the one who actually uh, immediately, you know, sort of, there was a call to arms and she, she raised an army and all that. Rani Lakshmibai took a long time to get to that stage. She was trying diplomacy and various other means, she wrote a lot of letters to the British agents and so she was a different kind of person, she wasn't really a warrior. But I think possibly because she was Hindu, uh, uh, I'm not sure who it was, but someone told me it was Nehru who, who sort of used her figure, but I think it went back even further. It started with Vidi Savarkar who wrote this book uh, about 1857. So, you know, um, for different reasons, she was the one plucked out of that, the, what would have otherwise been historical obscurity. 
to become this figure of, of inspiration. And then Subhadra Kumari Chauhan wrote a, this famous poem, which all, all of us who grew up in North India would have had to study. Khu uh, Bladi Mardani, that one, the Jain Jhansi Wali Rani thi. So um, she was a sort of, a, the, the figure that was presented to us in our school, in our primary school books was very much this unidimensional woman on a horse, baby strapped to her back. Nobody ever explained to us why there was a baby strapped to her back when she's riding into battle. None of it made sense. So, I mean, why would a woman go into battle and eventually be killed? with a little baby strapped to her back. So even as a child, I could tell there's something wrong with all this story. And the history teacher wasn't giving us enough information, perhaps even she didn't know. So um, the, the, the sort of mystery surrounding this iconic figure was, had, had been with me from childhood. But it was when I started researching her, I was looking into which woman to use. I wanted a female character. I wanted her to be from eight, the 19th century, basically British Indian history from that period. And I wanted her to be a strong person and someone who would, who would move me and therefore my reader. And so I kept returning. I tried to avoid her. I thought everybody knows her story. And I thought she dies so early, so what can I write about her? But eventually I couldn't. I couldn't let go. She kept sitting on my shoulder, like writers say sometimes, you know, couldn't get rid of her from there. So um, she, yeah, on researching her, I found that there were many other facets to her. And her as a, wife I found particularly interesting because she was very young, 14, when she got married, went across the country from the, uh, she grew up in uh, Bitur and was sent across, and Varanasi, sort of that region, was sent across to Jhansi as a 14 year old or thereabouts. No one has the exact dates. She married this man who was much older than her. He was already in his 40s. And then she lost a child. Again, Indian sources say she had a baby who was lost, and British sources say she was childless. Again, it's an interesting reason why Indian sources would want to not have her as being barren. So um, the, all these mysteries were still surrounding her, and the fact that he, she then became a widow very early on and dealt with her widowhood in a very strong and positive manner really, really appealed to me because I, you know, I've seen my mother becoming widowed quite early. I've seen friends of mine get becoming single for different reasons, just through quirks of fate sometimes. And it uh, really appealed to me that a woman in, 18, in the 1800s could deal with her own fate so positively. And she, she sort of rallied around the women in her court, made them all into mini warriors, actually. She used to train them. They all used to do PE and gym and riding on horses and all of that. And she was also quite an able administrator. She ran Jhansi State, which was a prosperous little state. It wasn't massive. It wasn't like Awadh, which is the neighbors, neighboring state, but she ran it very well. And I've been to Jhansi and seen how exquisite the one or two of the little palaces that still survive are. And the reason most of it didn't survive was the British, when they came and they stormed Jhansi, they burnt it to the ground. So that story was sort of something which I had not been taught. I didn't know how she had even met her death, except that she'd stood up to the British. Now, how did she stand up to the British? What did she do? Who eventually killed her? So all of that were the things I needed to know. And when I need to know something, that's actually a perfect vehicle to write a book, because then I'm doing two things at the same time. I'm multitasking, researching, learning, writing. So I, the research happened alongside the writing of the book. That's the only way I could manage historical fiction. I'm but, not a great uh, student of history. No, but when uh, the film rights were uh, taken from you, uh, was it, uh, I mean, did you actually, actually expect something like Manigarnika or? Well, the film rights I sold to Sushmita Sen's company. And they were not the people who made the Manikarnika film. So Sushmita Sen was very decent, actually. She flew me to Bombay and we did a proper contract and she paid me good money and all of that happened. But poor thing, she couldn't get to the next stage, which was to raise the big finances for the actual production. And it would have been an expensive production with all the forts and palaces and costumes and all of that. And uh, I suspect she wanted to play Mani Karnika. She was still relatively young at the time. She must, I think she wanted to play. She felt a real kinship with Lakshmi Bai's character. But as time passed and she couldn't raise the funds, I think she also realized that she was unlikely to be playing this character. So she lost interest a little bit. And that just lapsed. After 10 years or something, these rights lapse. And in the meantime, I think Kangana Ranaut and whoever those people were, they came up. 
they didn't come to me for rights or anything. They just did it the way I think filmmakers very often do it, which is they pick whichever bits they wanted. But it was also quite different. Some scenes I felt, the scene where she leaves her child and goes out for the final battle, there's a very similar scene in the film and I thought, I was watching it and I thought, you guys have read my book and you haven't given me even a penny for it. But they changed the ending and they didn't have the, the romantic angle, which was what got me into trouble also. So, um, yeah, it, it, was, it, it had departed from this enough for me to not be too... In any case, I'd earned money from it through another company, so I thought it's fair enough. Free fate has a funny way of... <laughs> their, uh, their advertisement was that, you know, that there will be no romantic sequence involving um, Manikarnika and this British um, official. Times have changed. Ah. <laughs> the, yeah, I would have been in a lot more trouble. I don't think it would have been just a UP man had this book come out more recently. And, you know, one has to say that we live in a far more censorious sort of climate at the moment. I don't, I don't know whether I'd have even dared to write it, to be perfectly honest. So, um, this was written, yeah, and I, funnily enough, the person who started the, the, the objecting to it and trying to rouse the crowds in Jhansi was a Congress MP called Pradeep Jain, I even know his name. Um, who was being interviewed on TV and things saying that this should be banned. His reading, funnily enough, wasn't the romance. That came later. Later on, people were saying, oh, she has sex with an Englishman. She doesn't. Anyone who rush rushes to buy this book thinking there's a sex scene with an English guy, don't buy it for that sake. It's just not there. She's, she has a very unspoken sort of attraction. It's not so much from her side, but the British agent has a certain attraction for her. And he was a real character. There was a guy called Major Ellis who was the British political agent in Jhansi. And he laid his career on the line to help Rani Lakshmi Bai. To the extent that Lord Dalhousie, and this is a letter that I have seen in the British archives. I've actually got a photograph of it. I use it in some of my presentations. He received a letter from Lord Dalhousie, who was the governor general of the East India Company at the time, absolutely lambasting him for daring to stand in support of this queen because they wanted to annex the state. They wanted to say she's a useless queen, she doesn't have an heir, a proper heir to the throne, so we should take the state over. And they wanted the state because they had to build the railway lines. So it was all very calculated on the part of the British. But um, Major Ellis took the right sort of, I mean, whether he did it out of a mere sense of justice, we will never know. But the fact is he stood up to the authorities and said, she's very able, she's a great administrator, she knows what she's doing, I don't think we have the right to annex her state. So what happened? Delausi made sure he was punished, he lost his job and he was sent off to a place in, called Panna. And that's the last we hear of him in history, from, from the sources, primary sources. So you sort of get stuck there with Major Ellis' story. And the reasons, history never tells you, these sources don't usually give you reasons why people are motivated to do certain things. So that's the job of the, that's where the novelist's imagination comes in. And I could have taken the view, yeah, he's a man of, of justice and he wanted to make sure nothing unfair happened. But I, I, the romantic in me couldn't quite cope with such a dry, dusty sort of narrative. So I came up with this idea that maybe, he, maybe, he was kind of attracted to her. She was a young widow. She was only, in, you know, in her 20s at the time. So... It was perfectly possible, and I stand by that possibility. And I'm a novelist. I'm not there as a, you know, a, a serious non-fiction writer. So apparently there is a very serious non-fiction book now out about both her and Begum Hazrat Mehal, both these women who played key roles at that time in very different ways. So Rudrangshu Mukherjee has written this book, and he had given a very good review of Rani ages ago. I think I saw an announcement for it, but I haven't actually got hold of it myself. I will as so soon as I can. How did you react to when your, you heard that your book is going to be banned? No, oh, I was terrified. I was really so frightened because I was working at the Board of Film Classification in London at the time. And I was, had to have my phone on silent. But I kept seeing this buzz, buzz, buzz from Penguin Books back in India. So the publicist, I had her number saved. She was the one trying to get through to me. And I, you know, I thought maybe they just wanted an interview or something and I never tweaked, I never figured at first. So finally when I managed to call her back, um, she said there's something going on, we don't know what it is, but if some, there's, there's murmurs coming from UP and if some journalist calls you, just don't say anything, we're doing, we're asking our lawyers to come up with a statement. So we'll present the statement. So 
uh, I was terrified not on behalf of myself because I, what I did was I took the rest of the afternoon off, I went home and I used to get NDTV in those days on my uh, the, the satellite, this thing I had, the package. So I tuned to NDTV which was the only Indian news uh, channel I had. And there was this uh, five, four minute package or something which showed crowds in Jhansi shouting this Pradeep Jain was being interviewed, some historian was also being interviewed. Um, the, the, they burnt an effigy which they said was Jai Shri Misra, hi, hi. <laughs> Shri Misra, these crowds do. A very plump effigy which really annoyed me. I thought, I'm not so plump. <laughs> so all that was happening and sitting in London far away, I thought, I'm safe, but I've got a mother who lives by herself in Kerala. I've got a, I knew this wasn't happening in Kerala. Thankfully, people here are a bit more kind of aware of the rights of writers. But I have a mother-in-law who was living by herself in Delhi. And I thought the next thing that will happen is they'll find my Delhi address and they'll go there expecting that I'm there. And my poor mother-in-law will be, you know, stuck, uh, unable to get out of her house. So I was really, really frightened. And that news package, they kept repeating, because like news channels do, that's all they had. So they kept repeating it through the day. And the next news package said, UP Assembly, Furore, this, that, and the other. It was Mayavati at the time. So Mayavati just said some Congress MP is saying, ban it, ban it, ban it. It was no skin off her nose. So it was actually quite unproblematic, all said and done. So the ban itself was sort of fizzled out. It wasn't as if this, there was, it didn't matter to Mayavati really. She, I don't think she really knew what was going on, but it, ban a book, yeah, what's the problem? Books are always banned, you know, it's like there's so many of them. So it got banned. But I did have a phone call from the bookseller there, Ram Advani, so one of the, he runs one of the biggest, owns one of the biggest bookshops in, on uh, Hazrat Ganj. And he rang up the people in Penguin who called me up and said, the book is selling like hotcakes. It's going like crazy. Can we send more books over because we're running out of copies of the book? So it has that sort of effect as well. So I can't complain too much, but actually the fear is something very strong. Actually, in Kerala, what we do is, you know, whatever the whatever happens at the center, if a center bans a book, we sell it like hotcakes. If center bans beef, we celebrate with the beef festival. So, um, in fact, when this book was actually having controversies up there, we had um, uh, all our major bookstores, you know, stocking up books of uh, Rani. Really? How That's nice. one of the reasons why so it actually become a bookshop. bestseller. You know, it would have anyway become a bestseller. But the, the pace in which it actually become a bestseller was fast. You know, you have to be really yeah. thankful to the Brahman Mahasabha and, you know, <laughs> the <laughs> people there. <You're> right. <laughs> now, um, coming back to my favorite book, again, Ancient Promises, you know, you will have to forgive me because it's my favorite. Perfectly uh, happy to talk about now, it. Now, at least three people came up to me saying, but they always say, Yo, Nyan, Ma'am, and the Janmandra Vatanangal Vaichitunda, and the rest of book. I saying, Ancient Promises Vaichitunda. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have to, so much to thank Priya for, for doing such a brilliant translation. Yeah, that's a brilliant I can't read it, but my mother, others who have read it tell me that it's really very beautifully done. Yeah, it, it, it is a, a beautiful translation mm. by Priya, ma'am. Um, and also the title is, itself is very nice. Mm. And and poetic. Uh, oh, yeah, she is, it. I think, a poet really poetry, at heart. Yeah. See, when uh, you were uh, writing uh, Ancient Promises, you know, um, topics like, you know, walking out of marriage, though we had um, uh, novels where, you know, women walk out of marriage, they were very, very prominent and we, they were selling. But uh, this book, this particular book, when it was released, you know, you had a woman walking out of a marriage, especially because being insensitive to her child who is having special needs. Now, uh, and which actually makes this character goes in search of, you know, mm, she takes some diploma and all in, uh, uh, yeah. you know, special Especially, needs and so yeah. on. So, um, you know, what, uh, nowadays, you know, it's like, you know, you have divorces being celebrated, people celebrating their divorces, you know, have, go to a resort, we have this decoupled, you know, kind of a Netflix series where they're se going to celebrate their uh, divorce Perfect. and so on. So, yeah. so how do you look at all this? And also, I want you to look at um, Kerala and the changing marriage scenario here, you know, yeah. how we are, uh, yeah, we had actually a session with uh, Leela Gulati ma'am where, you know, she was actually talking about how Kerala used to be a saner place with, you know, simple marriages and so on. But now we have this Haldi, this Mehendi, this Dan, Sangeet, you know, blindly aping what is happening in the uh, north. So what, how do you look at Kerala 
This uh, is such an interesting question and I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm the best position to answer it, but I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> uh, one thing I will say is that with the success of Ancient Promises, the ongoing success, so like 23 years down the line, if I still have young women writing to me saying, I love your book because I can see myself in it, I stop rejoicing at that point a little bit because while it's lovely to have a book that's a slow burn seller and it's, you know, it's, it's on university syllabuses and so on, um, it does worry me that to a large extent women or young girls are reading it and enjoying it because they, it, they feel it's still telling their story. And that is something which I would rather wasn't the case because I had sort of assumed when I go to a college to talk and this was about five years ago I went might have been university college or somewhere in Trivandrum I went to one of the colleges and what I noticed was a number of scooters outside that bikes and things which I were being you know used by the girls I saw girls getting on and zooming off and things which I would never have thought of seeing in my own college days when I was in St. Teresa's in Cochin so um, I thought oh my goodness this is really, this is empowerment just being able to be so mobile and getting around safely in a city and all of that to me meant a lot and then when I went into the talk and then I had these this, the question answer session girls were saying that they still relate to the story I thought where does that come from I mean that's how, that's so peculiar and what is it with Kerala that we seem to have we, we nurture these peculiarities on the one hand we have a highly educated population we have women's literacy at some kind of crazy high up there you compare the Kerala women with women in Bihar and UP and there's absolutely no comparison to be made. So we've got all of that going for us. Women are by and large getting educated, getting qualified, getting excellent jobs all over the place, high-flying careers and so on. Financial empowerment, which is to, in my mind one of the biggest forms of empowerment. But on the other hand, we have this continuing kind of conservatism, deep-seated, that we just can't seem to budge. I don't know, uh, the patriarchy is still very strong. People outside of Kerala say, oh, they say matriarchal society. They don't quite know the difference between matrilineal matriarch. You're from a matriarchal society. Women are all very strong. And then they ask me, why, why did you let this happen to you if that's your story? You should, you know, you come from a line of strong women. Yeah, but the problem is that Kerala doesn't change as much as we think. On the surface, we're changing rapidly. And I had, I'm not aware, I've heard of divorce parties in, in the UK, but I hadn't heard of any here. There's a part of me that says, yes, that's really great. Let's all go and have some divorce parties. But on the other hand, I know how shocked my mother would be, for instance, if I told her this. She would be still horrified. You know, she's, she would think that's not very Malayali, that's not the way we want to go. Leela Gulati is absolutely right. We've taken some of the wrong stuff from other states or Bollywood or wherever all this has come from. So we now spend lakhs and lakhs and lakhs and lakhs on a wedding because of the Sangeet and the Mehendi and all of that. But as previously ours used to be such a brilliantly, I'm talking about the Naya wedding, brilliantly simple, but it's all over in five minutes. So they don't want to be boring. So that, that's, yeah, in some aspects we've changed, but I can't help thinking it's all a bit surface. And deep down we're remaining this sort of deeply embedded in some sort of conservatism that we can't shift. You have such an illustrious great grand uncle, right? So I, I touched his picture on my way in. It yeah. was at the entrance. So I touched it and I, I thought, do I thank you? Because he died literally weeks before Ancient Promises came out. And my mother and I went to his to see Amai. And I had the manuscript, it was still in manuscript form. Because my plan had been to get his blessings, but he passed away. So Amai blessed it and I thought her hands would have touched many of his manuscripts and his books, so I, you know, I, I felt moved by that also. But um, later on, after the success of these couple of books and things, I thought, oh, I wonder, the timing of it was so, so, I thought I felt bad at the time, but do you think he's kind of benignly sending some <laughs> blessings from somewhere? He was fond of us, but it wasn't as if he's got his own, his grandson is a writer, now Raj here. Yeah. So I wish him great success. <laughs> he writes in Malayalam though, more than English. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. a Malayalam writer. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have this anxiety of influence that writers always talk about, you know, since you have a, uh, a yeah. great uncle, who is almost like, you know, Tagari, uh, Shivashankar Pilla and Chemmin are like, you know, our know. private positions, you know, Malayalis yeah. are so attached to this, uh, his yeah. works. I so uh, do you have that baggage 
ever on yeah, you? A little bit. A little bit because it's, uh, I don't think I'm writing the same sorts of books. I've got a very different kind of writing over a, a career. Um, he had, I think, a much stronger s a sense of social justice, which perhaps lack is lacking somewhat in mine. I'm not writing for the reason. I'm not writing with that kind of an agenda. But when people say, Tagarire Kocha or whatever, you know, they, and especially if I'm being introduced somewhere as that, and sometimes I get invited to a function where that's the chief introduction is my connection to him, then I do get a bit concerned because I feel I'm not living up to your expectations, I feel. If that's, if you know, they expect me to write in a certain way and I'm not. So just to that extent, but otherwise it's a very nice connection to have. <laughs> in Kerala, you get a lot of extra respect, respect. I think. Yeah, that's yeah, it. No yeah. doubt. So, um, you know, um, you, know yeah, you, you know, something about her women characters, you know, on the one hand, you have very meek and reticent and submissive women characters. Mm -hmm. uh, even the, our Janu is like that at the beginning of the yeah. book, right? She, she goes on, I mean, she, she go, takes a divorce and she moves out, but still, you know, I like to consider her to be very meek and submissive, yeah. um, accepting everything that her in-laws were actually asking her to do. And on the other hand, you have such daring women um, on the, you know, they, they are doing things which, you know, no woman at that time would have ever imagined to do. So how do you manage to make this balance between these characters? Are you, were you talking, referring to the divorce perhaps, that in the end it was quite daring of her or the other characters in other books? Other, other, characters, characters, other characters, other characters. I have some mad characters in those, especially those secrets books. <laughs> uh, secret books, you <laughs> know, you have women who are, you know, very, very, very secretive and, you know, sassy that women. killer instincts are there, you know. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've forgotten about some of those women actually, but you know that the, the, those three books were commissioned specifically to be, because the, f the first one was Secrets and Lies, and that was commissioned by a commercial fiction publisher in the UK. And what they wanted was um, a complete departure from, you know, like the God of Small Things and Ancient Promises kind of Indian women who have this kind of an image in the West a shy bride or, you know, someone covered in gold and sitting with her head down or sometimes you just see the feet of a, you know, then they're wearing sort of gold anklets or something and you know that it's probably a bride. Titles like Arranged Marriage and, you know, I think Chitra Banerjee's book also has elements of that. So they wanted, this publisher wanted to get away completely from that image of Indian women and I was actually pleased that they were because it's get, it was getting really stereotypical. So they said, we want really sort of uh, sassy, glamorous women who travel the world, who, and we want all the glamorous locations, if you can bring. And because they're commercial fiction publishers, there are certain boxes that have to be ticked. So I was busy ticking all those boxes in featuring these women who wear the you know, designer labels, and it's not me at all. But I was going out of my way to create these characters for them, for the publishers. So it was a slightly concocted, confected sort of uh, project. <laughs> so, uh, do you like this meek women or the Do I like ones? them? Uh, <gasps> the Shobha Day kind of characters, <laughs> you know? Starry eyes. I, I, when, I, when I was writing those, I started to like them very much. So even though I'd created them from a mix of things, the other stuff I'd read or some people whom I knew who were a lot more uh, go-getting than or uh, confident or whatever than I was. Um, but I started to like them and I started to identify some characteristics of theirs. Um, I picked up some stuff from them, you know, you sort of, to a small extent you become your characters, you, you sort of, some of it rubs off on you. So um, I'm sure my husband would be, sort of, would be much happier if I hadn't written the secrets books because suddenly I was, I was just slightly different, at least for the time I was writing it. You kind of inhabit your characters for a bit. So. Um, do I, what do I like more? I think what I, I get drawn to characters who are um, stoic, <laughs> who, are, who know that sometimes you have to wait it out and things don't happen miraculously all the time and who, who are willing to sort of persist, whatever the difficulties or the obstacles are, because there are many, and women in particular know this, that obstacles keep getting strewn in your path. Life is, it takes strange, twists and turns sometimes. But it's about knowing what, um, what's important to you and knowing how to sort of persist to get there. So I think to some extent Janu probably, so then 
whether that's something which is intrinsic in me and that reflects itself in a character like Janu. Um, but those are the characters, when I read them in other books as well, that I find myself warming to. I, I, I shy away a little bit from those who fall apart very quickly. I don't think I've had any character, I don't think I do it very well because I don't have the patience with uh, a person who might just, the, the first sight of trouble just falls apart and gets hysterical. So, yeah, if I think I would, I like these sort of strong women. <laughs> and quietly strong is nice in my book view. Uh, our uh, audience will be uh, waiting to uh, ask you questions. So before that, uh, let me ask you a very simple question. Though your books are very, very popular, you don't actually fall into the category called popular literature. Uh, you know, which, uh, you know, you would like to be called as one, but the problem is there are certain things that actually goes into the making of popular literature. Yeah. So right now in Kerala University also we have a syllabus where we have Bob Dylan and Shakespeare together, uh, Chaucer saying hello to, you know, uh, writers who are, you know, we consider to be popular, Chetan Bhagat for instance. And Chaucer so, no, and Chetan Bhagat? No, no, I mean not in the same paper, oh, but okay. they, are, they are part of the syllabus. Yeah. Uh, nobody would have actually thought like, you know, I think you have mentioned in one of your interviews that, you know, Bob Dylan getting a Nobel Prize is something which is commendable as far as popular literature is concerned. So, do you mind having this tag that you are a popular writer? Not in the slightest, no. Because I, I'm very definitely not a literary fiction writer. And that is, you know, the kind of books where they make you work very hard to find the meaning or to, to work your way through some really tricky sentences and work. That's not the way I enjoy writing. So I've always avoided that style of writing. I don't think I can do it anyway. So there's a much more straightforward, I mean, popular fiction employs a, a more straightforward path through the story and is usually more story oriented or character oriented. Whereas literary fiction depends much more on style uh, and you know, sort of stylistic flourishes. So I'm, I don't particularly, I mean, I do read quite a lot of literary fiction, so I, I guess I, you know, there is a part of me that likes it. But I, don't, I haven't tried to tread that path very much, um, in fact, none at all. So I have no problem because I think that does describe me better, popular fiction. And given the, you know, the, my readership, it's fairly clear that that's what's going on. Um, and yeah, the commercial fiction books in the UK, because that's a slightly different thing. So what they refer to as popular fiction is yet another sort of subset, if you like, where they do want to have certain things which popular fiction here doesn't necessarily look for. So it's, it's yeah, what is very nice if, is if publishers and academics don't insist on putting you in boxes <laughs> because it gets very difficult sometimes to stay within that box and you, you know, I might want to write something very different. In fact, what I'm writing at the moment is very different, so I don't know where that's headed at the moment, but it's not fiction and it's not quite an autobiography, but it is about an Indian woman or a brown woman in a white country. So the, pe the peculiar sort of challenges of being Indian in Britain We've got a prime minister now who's a brown character in a very white world. So the timing might be good from that point of view. But that's what's, that's not the reason why I was writing it, but that's, um, that's what's emerging. <laughs> it's nearly done actually, but I haven't found a, haven't got a publisher yet. 